so um, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm just going to briefly uh, tell you about Lea and the Art Science Research Group. Uh, Francis can start by letting you know what the Center of New York also is about, and then I'll take it from there for the Art Science Group. Uh, so the Centre de Costo is a research group that the VUB started in 1995 and we've been director since a year, since my colleague Derek was in my pension. And what we always have been doing is trying to bridge between all the possible disciplines and in particular between the human sciences, the social sciences and the natural sciences, the physical sciences. So we have physicists, mathematicians, but we also have philosophers artists, linguists, but we're trying to do any research that bridges and gives a kind of a broad picture that can ask deep questions. So people often think in terms of interdisciplinarity, if you combine one discipline with one discipline, it's interdisciplinary. So we are doing interdisciplinarity, but we're doing more than interdisciplinarity. We're trying really to integrate ideas from many different disciplines, so we want to confront very different opinions and like that give the chance for new ideas to emerge. So one of the things we want to bridge is art and science and I'll leave it up to uh, Katarina to say more about our art and science program. If you like, I was born in 69 and I started studying in the late 80s and um, I studied with Friedrich Kittler. I didn't study art and I also didn't study composition. But what I did was I studied uh, media sciences, which was then very new in Germany that you could do it. There was a new um, possibility to study it in Bochum in uh, Germany. And there my professor was um, Friedrich Kittler. I don't know if you know him. And he, he invited, during the time I was studying with him, he invited Wilhelm Flusser. I don't know if you know him. Um, another philosopher and um, the ideas of them, they are an important, they play an important role in the way I look at things and um, the way I approach things. Um, okay, and then, uh, so I studied until 94 and um, uh, my main interest, um, my main interest are has ever been our creative systems. And um, the, the question that I have is what, what drives um, creative systems? How do creative systems work? All kinds of uh, creative systems that has to do with the arts. And I show you some of these systems. Oh, I forgot to tell you that uh, the lecture has three parts. So in the um, first part, I want to give you a, a short introduction on the object of investigation. I told you already what it is. It's a, a um, creative system. And some basic concepts um, from which I look at uh, creative systems. Um, in the second part of the, of the um, lecture, I want to show you how we design the actual research process. Um, on investigating a creative system. And in the third part, I want to bring on some questions um, that have grown already along the way since we are doing this research project, which is now for a year, which is running now for a year. OK, so um, as a start, as I said, I'm deeply interested in creative um, systems. And the questions that drive me is, what makes creative systems work? So what are creative systems? This, for example, is a creative system. This is, a, to me, a very important creative system because this is the system why I went into the arts. Um, and this uh, system is still active uh, until today. And this is from a, a concert very recently in um, a photo taken a few weeks ago during the a concert in um, the United States. Another creative system is uh, this group of people. This is uh, the artist group um, Hobby Pop Museum, and I'm a member of this. Um, I'm a member of this uh, artist group, 
and we found it now 20 years ago, and this is a, this is a photo taken 20 years ago in uh, Düsseldorf, so this was our first, um, one of the first photos of our group, I don't know if you know who I am on this photo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm the guy from Miesin on the left, uh -huh. and uh, so I'm not sitting in the front row, but it's, um, and um, yes, we started out uh, in 1998, actually, so last year we had 20 years, uh, <coughs> last year 20 years, and this year um, uh, catalog came out with, with our complete works. So I studied in uh, Bochum, the others, they studied at the uh, Kunstakademie, at the Art Academy in Düsseldorf. And um, we met in Düsseldorf and we, we, our decision was that we want to do um, artist and we are still doing it. And um, it is interesting, so as I said, I, started, I studied with Friedrich Kittler uh, and Wilhelm Flusser and the others, they studied with, with several uh, professors, but they, almost all of them, uh, you see on this photo, they did study with uh, Oswald Wiener. He was professor then at the Art Academy in Düsseldorf and he plays quite an important role in Germany in the fine arts as one of the people who brought in cybernetic ideas into the into the fine arts, um, and so there was a so there was a um, so we had points of of interests uh, when we met, and we are an interdisciplinary group. Um, we are painters, architects, and me as a theorist on the one side, and on the other side, I'm composing. And um, I, Katharina and I, we were talking yesterday evening already a bit. So um, I st when I, I wanted to study in the 80s, but I didn't want to study fine arts, and I didn't want to study uh, composition. Um, when, I was, when I finished studying in 1994, uh, the school was founded, I would have done if it would have existed in the 80s, which is the K KHM in Cologne, the Kunsthochschule für Medien, so the art school for media, for interdisciplinary media things. So this school started in 1994, so there were no schools in our area in Germany who were doing these things in the 80s, and so my decision was to study with Friedrich Hitler because um, I, I, I found the book Gramophone Film Typewriter when I was at school and this really intrigued me. And then I found out that uh, Hitler just got, became professor in the university uh, uh, next to my hometown and uh, that they founded the, the um, media theory course there. And so this was my decision. And uh, the interest of all of us uh, was in to 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 do cooperations. Um, so we were interested in um, Ryan had such a good um, word for this a few minutes ago when we were uh, having a conversation. We we are we we were and we are still interested in what Ryan described as collective imagination. So. How does this work? How does a creative system work where there is no chef, uh, where there is no boss, but where there are um, people who are in conversation with each other and uh, who, who come up with uh, aesthetic events, uh, aesthetic objects, doing it collaboratively in conversation. And the special thing about Hobby Pop Museum is that we mostly uh, work on conversation without words which means that one of us starts with something and uh, the other one adds something or takes something away and builds it up so that we are so and we try to avoid to speak too much about what we are doing um, so this is this whole um, uh, problem we have already spoken uh, this midday and yesterday with with Katarina too I will come to it a little bit later and I'm sure that, that you all of you know this uh, problematic thing 
uh, German mathematician David Hilbert uh, described it as we have the system and we have the representation, the symbolic representation of the system and these both worlds, um, they are not the same. And so um, this is a big thing uh, within our group that we, uh, that we try to, what to do with the symbolic um, level when we are talking about what we are doing, when we get into a symbolic conversation about what we are doing, can we do it without words? Uh, which doesn't get us out of the symbolic uh, level because um, when I put something on the table like this, of course this is symbolic too. Uh, we can read it as a symbol, but it's something else. So um, let's say conversation beyond the Gutenberg galaxy, if you, if you like. So this is, a, this is a, um, one of the important uh, uh, things, just to give you an idea on what we are working plus the plus the interdisciplinary work. Uh, we had it already too in the discussion before we, we came here that um, a painter understands, uh, let's say, under the term light, a painter associates completely different things with light than an architect or as I does. So all these uh, kind of things um, uh, play an important role. So as a creative system, uh, how does it work? How do we get things done? So this is what we are really interested in. Plus, um, that we, uh, whenever we do an exhibition, um, we do the exhibition in the space where the exhibition will take place. So there is no studio, but we are, we are setting up the show in the space where it is, which means that we work at least for two weeks in the space where we are. Um, and there is no, um, personal assignment to the works. So it's not that Christian has done this and Sophie has done that. So it's not a group show, but it's Hobby Pop Museum. And it's a bit like the Rolling Stones um, uh, before, that the label is Hobby Pop Museum. So everything we do is Hobby Pop Museum, which is another thing which we are really interested in, the idea, the romantic idea of the art genius, uh, that we get rid of this idea which is also very subversive in the art market uh, field because the art market still works with the symbolic idea of the genius. You, you can make money just if you have the image of a, of a single solo genius, although we all know that there is no single person who is doing it, but it's, all, it's always that we are part of something, a bigger network, a bigger system, as you like. Uh, and this is another important idea we are working on. And this is another um, creative system. So, uh, yeah, so this I have to say, I, let me just switch back. So Hobby Pop Museum for all of us is kind of the mothership. So uh, on the one hand, it's an academy. This is really what we call an, a, an academy because we're learning from each other. Uh, now for 20 years, and if we are asked where did you study, we often say, well, we are still studying. We are studying with Hobby Pop Museum. This is our university, or this is our academy. Uh, plus, it's the mothership. So we started out with Hobby Pop Museum, um, but uh, of course, all of us have we have our solo careers too, um, which differentiates us maybe from from ideas of the 70s and 60s that you have to stick with your group. Uh, this is not the case. When we are together with Hobby Pop Museum, it's Hobby Pop Museum, and the rest is the rest. So when people, when I'm doing something as Christian, uh, it's me. If Sophie is something doing, if Matthias is something doing, and so on, it's it's um, our our personal kind of um, stuff and doesn't interfere um, with Hobby Pop Museum. Okay, and here you see uh, another creative system. This is uh, one of my actions. I call them actions. This happened in uh, 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 May this year at the Museum Volkwang in Essen. Um, I had an exhibition there uh, from a piece of mine which is called Lust und Rätsel, Riddle and Lust, mm, which also, so the title uh, maybe gives you some associations that, that both, if you want, to see, it, look at it in a dialectical way, you have these both um, levels or both areas in which uh, we are moving. On the one hand, you have the discursive uh, 
area which is uh, defined or symbolized by the riddle, and you have the the the, the dark. Sorry. The riddle. riddle. The riddle. Okay. Yes, the riddle uh, symbolizes the discursive area in which we are moving, and the lust, the lust, uh, of course, um, refers to the what Kant has described as the dark corners we still don't uh, getting hold of, hold on yet, but which are an important force in uh, doing things. So it's really this. Um, this idea, and um, this is an action, I don't call it performance, um, I call it action, and what I'm doing is, uh, within my actions, the first one I did in 2007, I think, oh, uh, this, is the, this was the poster for the, for the exhibition in, in the sort of Lust, Lust und Rätsel, you see it, so Riddle and, and Lust, um, and this was the first uh, action that I did uh, with students of mine in 2007 at the Kunstverein in uh, Düsseldorf. Uh, so I don't call it performance um, because performance is a complicated word to describe uh, what I'm doing. The things, the actions, I, I use the word actions in lack of a better word. Um, the action seems to be to me the most open description of what it is, but basically the, the it, it is um, artistic research. So it is artistic research um, and people are allowed to watch us uh, researching. This is the, this is, this is the idea of the, the actions that I'm doing. Uh, and um, they have to do with generative art. I would say that they are a special form of generative art because they are generative artistic research, which means that I, um, uh, let me have a look, um, yes, that I'm, I'm writing texts, uh, and I would not say, this is, a, this is another discussion, some people describe them as scores, but I wouldn't say that they are scores, they are more frameworks, uh, or let's say, um, meta systems, if you like, um, which enables uh, the people who take uh, part within these um, actions to uh, create their own uh, research awesome. systems. So um, uh, this is the this is the idea. And in a way, um, Ryan and I we were talking already a little bit about it yesterday night. In a way. If you want to have a comparison, you can describe them vague, vaguely as rule-based systems in the sense that um, the framework tells uh, the participants, um, and, it's, and it's that I'm always participate too, so it's not that I use other people as um, as a Versuchskaninchen, as we say in German, I don't know what the English expression is. <laughs> yes, exactly, as, uh, as rabbits. But yes, you know, but I'm a rabbit then myself. And we try to explore to find out how does this uh, system uh, works. And it's that this framework is in the sense rule-based um, that I'm saying, um, so they, they go like this. Uh, if you are aware of this, then do that and see what happens, you know. So this is the entry point of from which the um, actions are developed. And it's that these actions are very long, uh, they are long duration actions, and it's not about the idea of marathon, but it's the idea of to have time to collaboratively explore how artistic, uh, uh, how the artistic process, how this is working. So I would describe artistic research as, um, I wrote it somewhere here to, and now I don't find it um, <laughs> in my script. I describe uh, artistic <coughs> research as, um, as a tool to find out how um, artistic work works. So this, is, so this is my idea of artistic um, research. And I would say and only the artist is able to uh, to really do it because he knows how to do it. This is an um, important. Do you keep track of 
how this research happens? You make some recordings of things? Yes, so yes, notes? yes, yes. So this is, um, this is, so for example, one outcome of one of the things is this book, for example. And it's important um, that the group of people uh, is a mixture. So let me go back to, um, to, to this. So you have, uh, I bring together groups. I started out with homogeneous, homo do you say homogeneous? Homogeneous groups. But then I found out that it is um, much more interesting to, to bring together interdisciplinary groups. So I, I invite um, fine artists, composers, musicians, non-musicians, scientists, uh, designers, and of course uh, professionals, non-professionals, and also students, and all kinds of ages, which is important too within uh, these actions, so that um, so that we really do this uh, research. And um, they are long duration researches, which means that we really have time to do research. Uh, so um, this, this was the first one. This lasted eight hours. But now, in the meantime, I was able to do uh, research things that lasted a week. And the important thing is, uh, and the next thing I want to do, so a week was actually uh, at the MUCA. Uh, in Antwerp, I had the possibility to do it there for a week uh, on, on invitation and um, um, uh, now I lost the plot uh, I don't know what I wanted to say um, yes and uh, it is super important that whenever you as a participant or as an actor if you like Whenever you feel that your concentration is slipping away, then you just stop and you can uh, take a break and you can leave the environment. And the backstage environment is as important as the stage environment, although I don't call it stage because it's not about staging. It's just about that people are invited to watch us. You know, the, I took the basic inspiration from um, construction sites. You know, because construction sites, to me, it's super interesting to watch uh, uh, a construction site, how a construction site works. And the people who are doing the constructions, they are not doing it for the audience, but they're doing it for the construction. And of course, you have, sometimes they, 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 they find out that they are observed, and then they start to act constructing for the observers, which is super interesting. And this kind of stuff, always plays an important role. How is it when audience is there? How is it when audience is not there? How do you change your behavior? So all these, the, all these uh, questions, questions uh, play an important <coughs> role. And the different um, actions are seen under certain questions. So the framework of, of my text starts with, a, with one or two questions from where we uh, take it, from where we dive deep into examination of the questions. And the important thing is, so you can take a break when you are tired. And uh, super important is the conversations and the meetings. You know, So it's important that there is food, that there are drinks, that there are relaxing areas where you can sleep and everything, where you can take a rest. And it is important that we are in constant conversation with each other about our experiences, which is uh, the idea of self-observation. Uh, on the different levels and being observed by the others and how does the interaction work and out of and this is the the approach um, yes this is the approach of my performances this one uh, is a documentation of a one that I could do over the course of two years and I could invite uh, international people uh, for twelve um, of these actions at one space um, in uh, Düsseldorf. Um, yes. Can I ask if you so if you meet a week and you talk about sleeping places, so they 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 are together for a whole week? Yes, this is the idea. They, so the performance, well, the, the action uh, keeps on going during the night as well. Exactly, exactly, exactly. This is the idea, you know, so that you have constantly the possible possibility yeah. to go back and what is it now if it is night, for example, you know, how does this change? things, what do I observe, what do I find out, you know, this is exactly the idea, but it does not mean that you have to, you know, when you are sleeping at night, this is okay, but when you wake up, uh, then, and you think, well, 
maybe I should give it a try. You know, then, then, then yeah. it's like it's like that. Just wondering if you uh, the question you're yes. looking at is that the question of what is the experience or the observations by just being here and doing this, or do you sometimes feed in specific questions you're interested in? Yes, yes. Like guiding questions on the whole. Exactly, exactly. It's guiding, exactly. So some questions are open, you know, and some questions are super specif specific as, as, uh, as guiding questions, exactly. But is there a general purpose to such a meeting, or is it really open? Do you, ha do you expect to get some kind of a result out of it, or you just let it self organize? Uh, I let it, well, it's not that I expect a special outcome, but I, but I know that there will be a, a, an outcome, you know, but I don't know at the beginning what the outcome will be. So in this sense, it is uh, self-organized. But this is a super, Interesting questions. We we already talked about it yesterday. You know, with this word, the central scrutinizer. Because you, this is super complicated. Because what is my part in this? Uh, how do the people who who are participating with me this thing? Do they look at me as the as the leader? Mm -hmm. And do they try to do what I do? You know, all these kinds of. Do they try to? So, but uh, becoming aware of all these questions. This is. Um, well, we, we have called this process uh, guided self-organization. Oh. Guided in the sense that you create an environment where certain things are stimulated. Yes. If it goes in a different direction, fine as well. Yes, this is You great. facilitate self-organization by putting some guides, like maybe questions or maybe an environment that stimulates certain yes. activities. Or yes, yes, great. Well, you said, <coughs> you said earlier, that you saw research as a tool to find out how artistic work works. Yes. Then what is the uh, what is the artistic work at the beginning of the process? Um, yes. Let me come to this. Uh, um, let me come. Let me come. Let me come to this in a in a second. Maybe I it gives an answer to your to your mm. question. Do you have an question too? Well, uh, art is the exposition of a series of techniques that results in the artwork. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get it. Art is the exposition yeah. of a series of techniques that results in the artwork. Is that an answer to this question? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the result is the artwork and the exposition that, um, without words, is uh, the series of techniques that's been shown to the public. Well, there are techniques at play, of course, but these techniques are super, um, super easy. So it's not about uh, it's not about um, what's the word. It's not about uh, acrobatic, you know what I mean? It's not about... <laughs> uh, I know what the, um, So I know, sorry, there's a yeah. word. I'm yeah, trying yeah, to find yeah. that word that you're looking for. But like skillful, highly polished performance. Exactly, yeah. exactly. This is not, this is not yeah. the, this is, this is what it is not about. Mm. So it is really accessible that, as I said, that really everybody can take part. So you need not, and this is a, this is a, I, I have chosen this photo for a different reason, but um, so uh, um, uh, uh, this is uh, Katarina, and she, she took part as a student in the first performance, and she never played guitar before. And it's not about playing guitar, you know, but I will come to this, so you need not to play guitar uh, to take part in this performance. So it's not about techniques in the sense of artistic skills or that I know how to draw a cat or something like that, you know, and then at the end uh, it's, it's about other questions. Um, this is the, this, this is it. And there is an aesthetic event happening, coming out of it, but the interesting question is another question to which I will come maybe now. Yes. Katarina, <laughs> 
What do we want to say? No, I just <laughs> wanted to say maybe that clarifies that it's not about the technique, but the communication. So it's not mm -hmm. about communi what uh, technique you're using or, or what instrument. Yes. But rather the process of communicating. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I think, that, yeah, sorry, we're all oh, jumping please. in right now, but please. I think it's also probably that maybe it also helps to clarify it that because you use the word result. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think this is clearly an example of a process. Yes. Where the end result, there isn't, in a sense, an end yes, result. Yes, exactly. And the result is not important. And that's a, that's a shift also, like in art making, that's very important. And, and, yes. And to, not because sometimes when people think about art, they think about the thing at the end that gets exactly. made, the painting, the sculpture. So exactly. On. But that exactly. was your question as well. Hmm? That was your question as well. What is the art <coughs> from which you start questioning what is the artistic research? You actually ask what is this output from which you start? Uh, no, I didn't use the word output. No, mm -hmm. you said artwork. No, I said, um, I think what is the artwork? What is the art at the start of the process? Because if, well, I'm putting words into your mouth, but it's like, <laughs> if the, um, if the, if the, like, um, you know, like, if, if, wait, let me put this in a bit, in a neat way, like, if, um, you know, like, if the system is, if it's created by all of the participate, all of the participants participating and working together, they're all creating, they're collectively creating a system by their involvement and their interaction, but then they're also responding to that system which they create, yeah. right? There's yes. also, there's a complexity, a definition of emergence or a, a complex system, effectively. Yes. But then there is a situation, when, once the system is up and running, once the process is going, then there is, a, there is, a, there is a, something to respond to. There is an artwork to respond to, right? But the tricky question is like, what is the, how do you, what's the initial conditions? Like, how do you define that situation to which you respond? Mm -hmm at the beginning of the process. Yes. I suppose that's my question. Ah, okay, okay. So I can give you a, a concrete answer to this. For example, this performance, uh, which was called God's White Noise. So there was the idea, you have, um, you have the guitar, you have six strings, and I will come to this later again, because I pick up this setup uh, for the research, for the actual research project. Um, and now you have the choice, which uh, of these six strings do you choose? And this is the this is the setup. That's that's it. So <coughs> that's it. <coughs> okay. And mm. Okay. So yes, please. <laughs> Just to <laughs> sorry, <laughs> please. No, no, please. It's very interesting. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so the initial condition is actually is, is a form of constraint. Yes. So you rapidly reduce the number of mm -hmm. options Absolutely. down to Six exactly, and then it becomes yes. Then in a sense, you just have to choose between these six options, and that gets things going. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Plus, there are some more constraints, but this is but you know this is exactly that. And this is why it is rule based, you know. Mm. So, if this and that, then yeah. that and that, you know. Okay, um, so, uh, yeah, let me get back to this photo first. So, now I'm coming to the actual <laughs> research project. Uh, or, no, now I'm coming to a basic concept uh, from which I look at the creative process. Oh, wait, and this, this is exactly what you said, uh, that I'm interested in the process. And this is a side question, but which is also super important for me, and which we are working on with, with, uh, with several people is the question, shall we call it um, creative system or creative process? This is what I'm not sure about, you know, because system is already uh, making it less dynamic, maybe, I don't know, than the idea of a process. That, you know, because within, if you look at it as a sheer process, then you have um, agents which are in play and out of play, and you can change agents. Whereas if you think about a system, the agents are set. This is, you know, and uh, this is... This is just a word. I mean, if you have the rules already, it's a system. Right? 
if you put rules on something, then it's more a system than a process, right? No, you can have rule-based processes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Okay, but exactly. Like, like the way you name it doesn't make really a system. Uh, doesn't make a difference on what it will become. Right? No, I don't agree. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I want to introduce uh, a new terminology for complex design that the complex adaptive system, which is a system that doesn't have clear boundaries or agents yeah. coming in and out. So yeah. like the economy is a complex adaptive system, yes. but who is in the economy and who isn't, there are no clear boundaries. Yes, yes, exactly, unclear boundaries. This is, exa this is exactly that. But it might also be nice to find a non-noun. Hmm. To name it with. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the hatter in German. Creating. Uh, <laughs> yeah. a, a verbing. Yes. You know, uh, this is maybe typical German that we are. So you have Hegel, uh, the philosopher, and you have Hegel's mm -hmm. word of the uh, harter Arbeit am Begriff. You know, so it's really that, that, uh, that system is not. If you would name it system, uh, you think system. If you name it process, you think process. You know, and so it's really important how you work, what you are doing. I mean, and here we are again in this abyss between, let's say, the real thing and the symbolic representation. Or it, I think it's a little bit more complicated. You have uh, you have the real thing. If you put it in the Kantian way, the, the thing we don't have access to, uh, you have the model of it, and you have the symbolic representation of it with which I communicate with you about it, you know? So you really have this, I, I have to draw it, because this is what I'm thinking at the moment a lot about. So you have, if you have, uh, uh, so you have the real object of, real object, which I will call, let's call it air. You have the model of it, which I will call M, and you have the um, symbolic representation of the, so this is my internal model I have from the object, so internal model, <laughs> uh, and you have the symbolic representation, which will I call uh, symbolic, let's call it Yes, <laughs> maybe. And so you have the, uh, and now this interesting thing comes, you have the real object, then you have the model, the internal model I have from this object, oh, sorry. And um, then you have the symbolic representation, uh, which is SR. And now to me it gets really interesting because now, and this is cybernetics actually, or at least, and now you have the feedback from the symbolic uh, representation on my on the module, it modulates the internal model I have from. But by model, you mean either inside your head or the symbolic you mean shared. With exactly. Yeah. This is exactly what I mean. You know, this is the internal model I have. You know, and this is the symbolic representation that I can communicate or try to communicate with you about my internal uh, model I have from the object. And now we really get into this feedback uh, uh, feedback loop that, of course, the symbolic representations. If I read a book, or if I call it, if I call it, um, what did you say? Uh, system. System. Then I'm in this feedback thing, you know, because then, of course, it modulates my internal uh, model of the real object. So this is very complicated, and we're we're. Uh, yeah, this is Katharina refers to is that we are that we are trying to set up and the and the um, and the research project is one part of it that we uh, try to set up uh, uh, we call it new cybernetics for design um, and this is one of the questions we are we are working on because it's about communication design and the question is now what can communication design what can a communication designer what can he can he help within the situation. And this is, to me, the important part a communication designer today can play in society. So it's communication design, to me, is not about web design. You know what I mean? It's not about uh, making fancy surfaces, but it's really trying to help uh, within this uh, setup. Okay. 
So, okay, any more questions so far? Then I would try to take it to the one of the basic concepts from which I look at the uh, creative process. Um, so what did I write? Um, so the perspective I'm taking is um, I'm trying to explore and understand when I'm trying to understand how a creative process works, then I try to explore and understand how prehension works. Because I think prehension is one of the driving forces behind creative action. And now what is prehension? Do you know the term prehension? It's so uh, prehension is a term coined by Alfred North Whitehead. Do you know Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher? Okay, so he came up with a, with a, he coined this term uh, prehension, um, and um, and how do I use uh, the word prehension, which Whitehead coined? Well, I look at the artist as a prehensive subject, which means the artist uh, is doing artistic prehension which means the artist prehends how something has to be done within the creative process of designing an aesthetic event. And this is what you can see here. So this is part of the research process that uh, we are taking photographs of us in action. And I have chosen now three photos super uh, different where you see this moment where um, prehension is taking explain what prehension means. So there is a really good friend of mine, it's Ernest Wolf Gezo is his name. He's a philosopher. Uh, he's teaching at the American University in Cairo and he introduced me to the term prehension. So he's, he worked on uh, Whitehead and uh, Ernest came up in 1984 with the book uh, The Prehensive Subject. And from there I took the, the idea of prehension, or let's say that prehension is a concept uh, which is, can be used um, to look at the creative process. So um, prehension is you can say, or Ernest describes the prehension as a look in the eyes, for example. A look in the eyes, um, one look at the other, and you prehend. So prehend, you know, is, is we have this great, so Ernest is bilingual, he speaks German and English, he's a German-American, so the great thing is that we can communicate on this, uh, on this uh, level with each other because he would translate prehension, prehending as erfassen. Erfassen is a great German word, so erfassen means I can take this and if I take, yes, grasp. grasp. Right. Exactly. So if I grasp it, then I have it and then I can see it and then I uh, understand it. This is the one way. But it also means that I, I'm getting grasp by the, by the, by the object. Which means that prehension gives us, is as a concept, open to conscious and unconscious uh, ways of um, of uh, epistemological uh, thinking. It's this is really hard part for me. So just this would help me to understand. Yeah. I imagine it's related to the word comprehend. Yes. But, but what does it do when you take away the the com? The com. Yeah. yeah, this is the prehension thing. You know, this is really a special word which is coined by 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 Whitehead. This this is really this prehension. Well, I think prehension is like the French plaudre, which means to grasp. Yes, it's exactly. Would, would, it be, would it be the difference like percept and concept? That like prehension and comprehension. That you have like you see your own kind of. And then you kind of compre like you have like a percept and a concept, yes, something and, like this. But it also has the body in it, 
you know, so really this embodiment kind of thing that you really get hold get hold of things, but really in the literal, really in the literal way on the one end, but on the other hand that you are getting hold of too. So you know, so that you have this interactive uh, thing going on. This is it reminds me also of what's called sense making. You're making sense of the object, but mm. by making sense of it, you also change by it. Yeah. If your cognition changes <laughs> once you grasp the object and know what it means. Yes. Yes. I'm just I'm just starting to read white hat, and one of the things which struck me what what I found interesting about this prehension concept, as far as I understand it, yeah. I'm also not at the stage where I can explain to you what it is is that there's an agency, well, just what we're talking about now, that there's agency of objects, like it's not mm -hmm. only like our human subjects which are comprehending, but actually also objects have an agency, but also concepts have an agency, mm -hmm. which I found very interesting. And what I understood also is, and that's why I'm a bit puzzled by your uh, diagram there, with the real, the, like a real, real object in the model, is that, as far as I know, Whitehead came with this concept exactly, exactly to not think in these kind of bifurcations between like a reality which is inaccessible and sort of mental models which are all in the mind. Yes. And it's just like body mind problems, all these kind of things. Like you wanted to exactly get rid of all that. Yes. So I'm very confused to be honest that on one hand you talk about this prehension concept and on the other hand you just draw this yes. uh, diagram on the board which is very Kantian as you said. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, this is uh, this is an uh, important point because this is also belongs to the to my research projects in general that I use different models and let's see what happens if are uh, more models in play than one model mm. you know and let's see do they can you put them together can you merge them are they contradictory to each other and what happens if I do it this way you know mm. this is what I find super interesting plus that um, this is an important part that um, uh, I improvise with these models, you know, so that I really uh, rearrange a model and let's see how far we get with this. Uh, um, and within the conversation um, and exchange, uh, oh no, this does not work so good, or let's see, this is works a little bit better, so really bring in, uh, well, more is more. <laughs> so it's not about reduction no. in this, in this, in this point. Because I will bring in more models. Can I ask, just to make sure that we, we mean the same thing with the words, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm reading a little bit of white in here, and it also calls it uh, unco uncognitive apprehension. Mm -hmm. So what, what comes to mind with, for me is that you can appreciate a painting without really understanding all the technical, yes. all the difficulty of it, but yes. you can just appreciate the beauty of it without really understanding why. Yes. Is that a little bit the same? Because for me, that's like totally different than sense making. So I'm trying to. Yeah, it's now. This is really this this thing. Now you read. I don't know what you have read. Is it Wikipedia or I it's don't know or something else? But it's always that we are looking through things, no, or that we are looking at things through images. Yeah. This is Fichte that are. Do you know Fichte, the, the, the German philosopher? We always look at things through images of things, you know? And this is, this is another, this is, I mean, this is this, is this thing that uh, we have to be aware, because when I'm talking about Whitehead, I'm looking at Whitehead through the eyes of Ernest. Mm. See, which is not okay. the same. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure anybody really understood Whitehead the way Whitehead wanted to be. Understood. Yeah, exactly, so exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that helps. Uh, okay, and what I said is what the term makes interesting for me is that it, this term, prehension, the way Ernest describes it is that it is open for both forms of knowledge, for conscious and non-conscious knowledge, um, for discursive and non-discursive knowledge. You know, this is, the, this is the point where this term becomes really interesting. And the thing is now that I use it, again, different than Ernest does, because Ernest is using it as the, 
recipient, re recipient, mm -hmm. as you describe it. You know what? Can you tell me your name? Mixel. Mi Mixel. So um, Mixel, as you described it. You know, this is a recipient way. I look at a painting, mm -hmm. and uh, now how does this interaction works as a recipient? But for me, this prehension is really interesting. And this is a discussion, Ernest and I. We have. Uh, we have going at the moment and we discussed it two days ago because he was visiting me in, in uh, this sort of we have a constant uh, conversation on this is that it is interesting for me as the one who is producing something not not uh, not just uh, getting something but this is these are the moments where people produce something and they are in this pre and they are uh, this is the moment of prehension you know because as I said, prehension as a, uh, within a uh, creative process means to prehend what to do next. What I, what I want to say is, so you have six strings. What is the choice of uh, which string do you choose? And uh, as an artist, or in the creative process, the moment of prehension is uh, that you prehend which string to use next. Mm -hmm. You know? And how does how does this work? This is the and, and there the there and for this question, the the term of prehension opens up a lot of possibilities to to look at. It's a wide spectrum of things that are opened up. Where you from? Where you can take research? You know, from where you can point of access into research. I'm developing a. a concept of the construction of meaning, where one of the important dimensions is the action, the performance is for action, the knowing what you want, knowing what you can do, knowing what the thing is, and all that, you could say, falls under this notion of prehension. Yeah. Once you have the prehension, in a sense, you know what to do next with the thing. E exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This is... It's it's like grasping the thing enough to know what's the next step. Yes, exactly. This is... This is, and you see here that you, if you look closely at the, you see the different shades of prehension that are going on, you know, like here with her or here um, with Timo, it's, it's, it's always, it's, it's always, or here super, super, super in, it's so hard to do this fine, uh, differences to get them across in, 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 in English, but this is um, so. This I really study closely with with students also, you know, to see how different this moment of prehension is. Yeah, here's another here's another one, and you can see it by the body language and everything that that they are what what is at play. This is exactly what we are doing then that we discuss while we're doing these research things, uh, what, you know, how was this moment of prehension, you know, to, to put it on a discursive, or trying to get it on a discursive level. It's interesting also because most of these phot photographs are also <coughs> the, the suspension of physical prehension. Yeah, suspension is a good word. Like they're not, like, uh, they're not physically grasping something. It's, it's, mm. that, it's that exactly delaying that moment between getting the impulse to grab something physically and actually doing it. Exactly. So I think yeah. it is the preparedness for the physical action. Yes. Not the physical action yeah. itself, but the fact that suddenly you're prepared, you know what to do next. Exactly. So it's, uh, yes, but it's also it's interesting because I was just like the, the definition of prehensile is also like we use the word prehensile to talk, you know, like about hands and monkeys' tails and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And yeah. Prehensile <laughs> tails. <laughs> and like <laughs> elephant trunks. These are all described as prehensile because they have the ability to pick, to grasp something. Right? Yeah. But we never talk about our minds as being prehensile. Mm -hmm. But they are, it is exactly yes. this. It would seem to be this kind of, uh, this internalization or this preparation for grasping but we have that, as humans, we have that capacity to mentally grasp it before we physically grasp it. But they're so intimately, I would suggest, related. Uh, let's go to the, to the metaphor of grasping. It's a typical example of a conceptual metaphor. Conceptual metaphor is something that's yeah. initially embodied, 
taking something, sorry, a <laughs> grasping, and then you put it into a different level where you use it to describe something abstract, namely mentally grasping. But what is carried over from the one to the other? I think what is carried over is the moment you grasp something, you have control over it. You can move it, you can position it, you can yes. you have control of it. So the mental grasping is that you have control of the moment of the concept. You say, okay, now I know what to do. I know what it means. Yes. Yes. Did you say control or did you say feeling? Because Sorry? Did you feel it then? Feeling is a, yeah, feeling is a word. A feeling, but feeling, control is, is the next level. feeling is a word uh, writer is using himself to describe, you know, one of the. Yeah, feeling could be just touching. I can touch yeah. something and I can grasp something. If I, if I feel it, I don't yet have control. If I grasp it, I have control. Finish it really. Ah, yes, yes, yes. yes. Most words have a double meaning originally. Yeah. The old meaning finish it. It. it's very good. Yeah. It. It. it begins with hands, tools, fingers and so on. Like Italian, capire, capito, also originally was take it. Fasten. Yeah, come yeah. 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 And what to it. Oh, this it's is always great. double. This is great. Capish. Capish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I also hear. Yeah. In, in Dutch it's begrijpen. Yeah, begrijpen. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's always double. Yeah, yeah. It starts from an organic thing yeah. and then it's transcendent. Yeah. Yeah. Something else. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. But I also hear from that um, intention, maybe we touched on it, is that it's not action, but it's uh, kind of waiting for an impulse. So it's a very subtle, yeah, yes, exactly. a mm. subtle something yes. relating, I think, to the topic you're talking about, at least intuition, yeah. Yeah, where yeah, you yeah, kind yeah. of tap into some knowing which is beyond mine, mm. and which then enters the, yeah, the, the physical philosophy and, and, and sense making. But mm -hmm. I think the waiting for the impulse. Yeah, this is a. That's how I would. This is waiting for the impulse, and you know. And then it comes. Yes. And then you know. Yes. Impulse or inspiration? Would it's a trigger? Trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if you mean impulse or inspiration. That was a little bit for me not clear. In the touch of the news, I mean that thing. <laughs> Yeah, this. It's a very subtle change yeah, yeah. in your perception of not sensory. Mm -hmm. But it's also it's something also about some kind of theory making, I think, or something. It not maybe not always, but it could be like this in a sense. You know, normally you get a kind of like a, an input. You're in a situation and you kind of act. Usually, you know, you're walking down the street, someone comes at you, yeah. move. And here it's like there's also almost like a kind of a buffer put in between yes. um, the, the, the input and the and your decision to act upon it. And that buffer becomes a kind of like a holding place in which to insert a, a reason to act, like a rule, a hypothesis. Uh, you know, like I should do this because of this image, this feeling, this uh, yes. potential uh, relationship or yes. world. Or yes. Uh, wait, let me, yeah. Uh, this is another one, this is, yeah. So, and this too, you know, again, I mean, this is why it all started with me, because as a kid, I saw him playing guitar and I wanted to play guitar myself. And I still, uh, so this is again from the same concert this year in, in America. And you can see the moment of uh, prehension, you know. But this is after prehension. Now he executes, you know. And it is super interesting that this, um, uh, uh, you can really look at Keith Richards, how this prehension thing, it's going on all the time. You know, with, this is the interesting thing about the Rolling Stones, that they, uh, on this, on this uh, rock level, they do this improvisation kind of thing, and they really have this prehension thing going, which is my theory. <laughs> you know what I mean? But this is, but, but you can really, you can, you can really see it in this minimal uh, 
space that is left within a straight beat which is given? Do I put the do I put the do I put the accent of my playing? Do I put it here or do I put it there or do I put it there or do I put it there? And this is really this this uh, super interesting thing. And they and they really have this super high concentration on stage to 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 let this prehension thing happen. This is what fascinates me. Uh, um, this, it's not about skillful uh, improvisation in the sense of you know melody and things like that, but it's really this super um, constrained repertoire, and then uh, doing the selection of it, you know, which brings me to the next. So, just prehension is still a little bit new concept for me. So, but that's so prehension is then a doorway into flow. Mm -hmm. Mm. I, I wanted to make a similar remark, but yeah. with a qualification. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm not. Yeah, it's. I don't know. I don't know if it's flow. I'm not I think flow. It's when you have a continuation of this moment. The prehension is the moment when it starts. You might say, well, the flow yeah. is once okay. you get this contour, when you have graphed the thing, you can move the thing along, and you are in flow, and you have control yeah. over. It. Yeah, but it's but the moment just before. Yes, it's yeah. yeah yes. But then the a doorway. A doorway. A doorway. That's what I. Oh, this is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then the door, the the flow is short, you know, and then the flow stops again, and you have okay. to. This is the interesting part of it. It's the same with the late improvisations by Miles Davis, uh, you know, in the in the eighties when he. He has, in the 80s, he had this constraint that he had not enough breath anymore. And this is super interesting how he deals with this constraint because he really, he really do, is doing this prehension thing all the time. And then he plays and suddenly, and then you know exactly, he has, he has this prehension moments and then I call it execution then. And this is the flow. But this flow moment is super short, but then it's really flow and it's really on the point. And you can do it, and you can do it consciously. In this moment, it's not possible. But the preparation to it, this is the, this is this prehension thing, and this is running on on different levels, and 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 trying to decode these different levels. This is what I'm keen on. This is yeah. this is exactly that. And what? Once I do my paper on the construction of meaning, it's not speaking about the things in the moment yet, but I should add a section on that. But it's speaking about the components of making sense so that you come in the situation where you know what to do. Mm. You're confronted with something that's new, like a guitar. I've never played a guitar, what should I do? And then you go to a state where it makes sense and you have yeah. you know what to do. So yes. Would, would it be? imagination of the impact of the action you're about to take. I'm just thinking about that would be one of the components maybe. Yeah, I just like mirror neuron neuroning the action you're about to take just about and then you just take the action. Yes, this is this yes. is a this a series of yeah. my research um, actions dealt with this thing. Let's imagine uh, the thing before you execute it, you know? And don't execute before you haven't imagined it completely. You know, Im improvisers yes. often. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, prehension would mean like that you, so does prehension mean that it's an instant process or moment where you get ideas from a guitar, for example? that you try to make something out of those ideas to get the result. This is one possibility of it. This is one possibility, but there are, uh, I would say there are myriads of other possibilities, how it works. This is, if you put it to impulse, this would be an impulse, if we call it impulse for a moment. This could be an impulse, but there are other impulses that, you know, but it's also about, yeah, it's again about this thing you said about like taking a break relates, relates to this, right? So if you don't have prehension in that moment, i.e. you're not acting on some, you know, some, like, some clarity, some impulse, something which you've grasped or somehow seen, yeah. then you don't act. 
you take you take away. Yes. This gives yeah, this gives the ability to create it's, it's very cybernetic because then if without this prehension, in a sense you don't really have this um, what you what would you call it? This coupling between like the input and the in the output. Yeah. In a way, you're just doing something. You're just adding noise to the system. Yes, exactly. But the moment you have a kind of a theory yeah. which connects the input to the output, then there's the possibility of coupling. And yeah. then there's the possibility Absolutely. that somebody else in the room will understand what you're doing. Yes. And yeah. then you'll arrive at a certain kind of synchrony and, and self-organization. Exactly. But, but without that moment of taking time for prehension, it's very difficult to come to that point. Yes. Yeah. And at the moment as you describe it might be described in information theoretic terms that you start with a very high uncertainty about what to do next and then at the moment of prehension that uncertainty collapses and you know what to do. Yes. 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 Exactly. Yes. So you're you're waiting for that that collapse of possibility yeah. into what we Yes, we call information. Exactly. An idea. And it might be right, it might be wrong, but the point is it's collapsed into something. Yes. And then you can try it and see what happens. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this and this is why it's not uh, techniques and results. You know what I mean? Because you don't have this technique at the beginning. It it happens then. This is the difference. Do you want so yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you, for example, have a pianist, pianist that knows a song by heart. Is the moment of prehension just before it touches his first note, or is it during the whole song, each time that he's going to play one note, yeah. that he has a moment of prehension? Uh, it's, so <laughs> it depends on. So it uh, it depends on if you want to do if you get into this research mode. So of course you can play a tune without anything, you know? But I'm interested in artistic processes where this prehension thing is obviously at play and the people are more or less conscious about it, if they call it prehension or not. This is why I'm super fascinated by Keith Richards because it's going on there all the time. Uh, you might say it's the moment of the reduction of uncertainty. If there is no uncertainty, that means you play a piece by heart, then it's not really prehension. The prehension is yeah. the moment where you start from uncertainty now. All yeah. these things I could do, and yeah. then suddenly you know what to exactly. do. Exactly, exactly. And this is what I find super interesting about the Rolling Stones, that they have this constraint, which is you you have, I can get no satisfaction. Everybody wants to hear, I can get no satisfaction. Yeah. In a recognizable way. And what they are doing is that they improvise within this super constrained uh, field of, of possibilities, they really do it super... But this is the difference also between, I think all good mus musicians do this, even if they know the piece. It, like if you're a classical music pianist and you know the piece inside out. But this is the difference, right, between, say, listening to a computer play, yes. like a MIDI playing the piece, and listening to a skilled musician. Yes. The MIDI just just follows the notes. But the musician is constantly yeah. taking. He's also he's, he he puts himself into like a cybernetic relationship with the melody, yes. right? With the yes. emergence of melody, which is an in, maybe an internalized thing. But he's putting himself into a relationship with that uh, thing, and then and then constantly questioning. Okay, how do you interact with that? Yes. Right? Which you need this aspect of flow, if someone was talking about flow, you need to have that element of flow that you don't have to think about certain aspects, like where to put your fingers, which allows you to take this, this distance, slight distance in terms of how you interact with the material, which then gives it its beauty also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had the... We had the <laughs> yeah, it was still not a question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, it's still not completely clear to me in which direction you are going because on one side you say I'm studying Keith Richards or maybe you can study any type of artist and see how they do it yes. and what their, what their yeah, objectives are or I don't know what but at the same time are you also trying to make an artistic work in some way or another is that also your intention or yes, not? Yes, yes Because that's much more difficult to make an artistic work, 
using I don't know what. Is that is that true? Yeah, yeah, the interesting thing is that out of the research an artistic piece emerges, you know? So this is really this uh, autopoesis kind of thing. Yeah, but how do you do that? How do you then finally come to a, the new artistic work when you study from key literature? Oh no, this is just, you know, this, yeah. this here, these are artistic yeah. works, you know? So it's the same, it's just, a, it's just the, I just showed him because this is the, my moment of where I got into it. Yeah, I understand, but still, how do you make a new artistic work? Does it uh, does, does, are you asking me, do you like it, or do you ask people, do you like it? No, 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 no. <laughs> 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 okay. I don't, that all depends on what we call an artistic work. Yes, I, I, I understand. <laughs> 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 we have had a discussion here once when we had an outside yeah. seminar, so yeah. <laughs> I don't think we need to get into that. Yeah. In what way is prehension then uh, the way of setting an intention? I mean, not not in the. Uh, let's take a, a not so common view. If you mean like before you go into a meditation, you the, the the way to make a meditation work is to set an intention for that meditation, and that, then you are putting an intention where you have cognition. So. I wonder in what way then the, the way you're describing prehension is actually a way of setting an, in, an intention of an uncognition of, an, of something you don't know. I don't think you need to have an intention. I think, yeah, I think you could. You can, uh, well, we have to define intention because the intention. Interesting <laughs> research, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what well, you put as I said, the intention the on the research side of things is of course you know exploring what is going on there in this so what are the possibilities of uh, as we described it before we had a good um, and uh, the intention I don't know the intention can be that you want to do prehension you yeah, know exactly. yeah you want to grasp it. yeah but I think that is an implicit intention we all want to grasp the things that we're interacting with the yeah. confronting yes. uh, the brain works. Yes. But you know, for example, what I find super or what really is also besides Keith Richards, um, it's is Beethoven and his uh, piano sonatas. Mm -hmm. Do you know them? Because you can really you can really hear or read or however you have access to it. Um, that he's doing that he that these sonatas are um, bricolage of all these different kind of things. So some things are just pure execution of formalized uh, of a formalized formula. For example, he's doing this. Then you find out that some parts are uh, 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 um, came about via superprehension. And then he starts to make fun out of himself, in, in a, you know, and and then super intention things are happening, and then he's 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 driving them against the wall. So this is, I really find fascinating. We, we, it's a kind of montage going on, you know, from so which uh, yeah, uh, which means that um, in coming up with a piece of art, all different kinds of possibilities can be at work, but what I'm doing in my actions, it is really, let's concentrate just on this prehension side of things, you know, really to explore this thing. So, and so you can say that all the actions are variations of a basic theme, if you like. But mm -hmm. how then do you set up the situation in which you can study the prevention by providing people with these instruments and environments yes. and yes. then watching exactly when they kind of get the sons that know, they know what they're going to do. Yes, yes. So there is the script. Uh, the actors get the script beforehand, before we meet. Then we have a meeting, and we are so. And it starts that beforehand. There's a lot of uh, email things going on and everything, so uh, unclear questions are cleared. And then uh, we meet, and then we discuss it, and then uh, and then we start. And 
and because it's a conversation, it's an ongoing uh, process, you know, it's, it's really so that, for example, that I don't play, but I decide to observe you, for example, if you take part. And then I tell you later what I have observed, what my impression was, what you were doing, and then you explain to me what your expression was, what you were doing, you know? And so, so it's this, this, this kind of thing which is, which is going on. It's also this, Katharina and I were talking about it yesterday evening too, it's also about this uh, uh, different orders of uh, observation, you know, second order observation, and this kind of thing, third order observation, and how far, and you just can do it in a collective. This is, uh, you can't do it on your own. This is, um, this is, so, and then you get, of course, within all these uh, complicated, symbolic, uh, intercommunicational problems I try to point out here, which you, has, which you have to have also on your mind. Sorry. Have you ever repeated uh, the creation of an artwork with the same rules, the same premise? Yes, yes, yes. And it's, uh, it's uh, I learned from it, so this, this uh, God's White Noise, I, we did a lot of times. Um, and um, it's, well, of course, which is interesting because, um, and this might bring, is another dimension of, because of, of course you have then this thing that it, on the one hand, because it's so super constrained, just six strings tuned to a, to a open tuning. So you have six uh, pitches, and you have the combinations of uh, it's uh, seven guitars. You know, seven guitars, uh, six pitches, and then you have this Wahrscheinlichkeitsverteilung. Um, uh, yes, exactly. You know, which comes at play on this uh, production level. But this is not. But this is a level which is also running. And via this uh, Wahrscheinlichkeitsverteilung, uh, and this is a this is a common uh, this is a common concept in in modern uh, electronic music that you use this to create an aesthetic form, you know. And so there comes up this aesthetic form, and um, and you know, and it's never the same, of course, you know, because then if you switch to this point of view, of course the the the, the actors become generators. You know, yes. which which act in an unforeseen way, yeah. and so it's always and, and, and because it's so super constrained uh, concerning the pitches, of course you recognize ah this is God's white noise I experienced it before, but of course it's not the same so it's the same and not the same. Because we're an hour and a half in, and we have the room reserved for another hour, and you have some audio that you can play. So mm -hmm. maybe we can hear some of these actions. Yeah, but this the, the audio I brought is not a, an actual action, but this is a this is a montage of um, this is a, something else. I have to. Uh, so it, it's not a it's not a documentation of a of a actual action. But this is a, this is. Okay. <laughs> but we got a uh, plan when we play, play it. Yes, so yes. Because it seems very, very dispersive yeah, in the conversation. So <laughs> I'm just saying. Welcome to the seminars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what are we doing? Short break then? Or, or keep going? Keep going. Keep going for two hours. Hmm. Topic. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be in the short break. It's like two minutes. Just yeah. air, then come back. Okay. Yeah. But I need to. That's me. I don't know. I think okay. that's you. Yeah. <laughs> How to take? So we had. Um, let me summarize. Um, so we have looked at prehension, and uh, that this is the as I try to put it, the force that drives the creative process. And then, um, we had this good, 
luckily we, we recorded it. We have this good description. Um, so and that I'm interested in this thing, and then uh, if I'm in this prehensive prehension kind of state, that all these possibilities are open up, and I want to explore how um, it. So what are the impulses or what are the forces? Or and now this is the question to which I will come. This is my question actually. So how shall we define? what is uh, happening there. Okay, um, let me just do one step before I come to this uh, question. And this is so that at the actual research project I'm doing at, at, the, at school is, so that the question now and why this whole thing is called artificial intuition is, 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 Okay, we have this prehension thing going, but the interesting question is, is it possible to formalize this process? Uh, ah, now we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if we are able to formalize it, what we don't know yet, is it then possible to turn the formalization, the symbolic description, into a machine? This is another question, which is, uh, which is going on. But to, to come to the point that I can describe prehension at all, to try to give it a formalization, I have to look at the prehension via another image. And this image uh, is uh, the term intuitive selection. Um, because I think, so the, the, the term intuitive selection is coined by Frieda Nake. I don't know if you, if you know him, Frieda Nake. Uh, again, he's, he's a friend of mine. We, we, we became lately friends. Um, and he's a, he's a, he's a, he's, a, yeah, you can say, yeah, he is, he's a pioneer of computer arts. He, he, along with two other people, with Georg Nees and Michael Noll in America, um, he's the first one who did computer graphics uh, in the early 60s. This was in Stuttgart. So uh, Frieda is a um, mathematician, originally, but he also studied with uh, Max Benze and came there in touch with the idea of generative aesthetics. Because this term, generative aesthetics, is coined by um, Max Benze. Do you know Max Benze, the German philosopher? Have you heard of him? Well, this is super interesting. This is um, another, we were talking about it. Uh, I think he's not really translated into English. Uh, so parts of it. Not parts of it are. So you know, you know Max Benze? Yeah, I read some of it. Ah, OK. Ago, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is. Super interesting. Um, this is another side road, but maybe I, I uh, just to give you an impression. So um, you have Max Benze in Stuttgart, and you have Werner Meyer Eppler in Bonn, and um, both were inspired by information theory of Claude Shannon. And they brought information theory um, and cybernetic ideas uh, to Germany. And, um, and I was confronted with information theory um, and system theory and cybernetics with Friedrich Hitler. And so I had this um, understanding for this. And, and, uh, what is, and at the moment, I'm working together with Wilfried Dursten, who is an art historian. I'm working on a, we, were, we are working on a book that we are writing. And it's about, we want to more or less rewrite the history of German art after 1945, because um, so post-German art uh, along the Rhine, you could say, because you have in Bonn, you have uh, Meyer Eppler, and in Stuttgart you have Max Benze. And um, it is interesting that which artists studied with these uh, people. So you have um, with Max Benze, Mary Bauermeister did study. And with uh, Werner Meyer Eppler, Karl Heinz Stockhausen did study. And uh, so this is interesting that the whole approach to electronic music, as it was developed in the Studio for Electronische Musik at the Westdeutsche Rundfunk in Köln, uh, is 
is based on the ideas uh, of cybernetics and Werner Meyer Epler and information theory, and not and comes not from the from Schönberg or from Bartok or whatever, you know. So this is so this is really the break on the one hand, and on the other hand in Stuttgart you have uh, Max Benze and uh, people like Frieda Nake studied with him, and they really went into computer uh, art. And you have uh, Marie Bauermeister who studied with him. Uh, she went into the fine arts. And then you have the whole literature scene. And we were talking yesterday night about um, Yes. And uh, so you have in, in Stuttgart, you have this German, uh, this Stuttgart Frankfurt, you have this uh, German literature circle, which is hev heavily inspired by, by Max Benze, like um, Franz Mohn, and these people, I guess you don't know them, but in Germany they are known, and they also came up with the idea of generative aesthetics in literature, that you don't write a text, but that you invent a machine that writes a text. This is, so this is basically the, the idea of generative aesthetics, which is also by which I'm also intrigued. Um, okay, so Frida has studied with uh, Max Benze in Frida now. Um, if you talk with him, he would say that prehension can be described with his term of intuitive selection. And, um, and the idea of intuitive selection is, is uh, of course deeply rooted in, in in mathematical uh, thinking, um, because you know, in algebra, you have the set of elements and you have the operations that you operate on the elements. Also, über die Elemente operieren in, in, in um, uh, uh, German. And the, I think, now comes in again my perspective, is that this idea, that for the idea of selection, um, you need another, oh no, this is not my idea, this is of course Max Benze. Uh, so you have, if you're talking about selection uh, as artistic process, if artistic process is selection, intuitive selection, which is prehension, or prehension can be, can be described as intuitive, as a process of intuitive selection, then you not only have selection, but you also have the repertory. So it is a two. It, it needs two elements. You have the repertory, and you have the uh, selection out of the out of the repertory. And I think that this idea of repertory and uh, selection is based on an even deeper um, concept, which is the concept of emanation, which is really a concept that is running. So you have these two. I would say um, you have these two concepts. You have on the one hand the emanative concept, and on the other hand you have the evolutionary concept. So the emanative concept, uh, uh, an image for the emanative concept is the paradise, where everything is there. And so it's the full, the fülle. It's coming out of the fülle, and all we have to do is we have to select. But everything is there. Um, and on the other hand, you have the evolutionary um, concept, which is that you have the seed, and that the seed, that it is growing, you know, so that you grow, that, you, that things are developing from minor to major. This is the idea of growing, and the idea of uh, emanation and selection is that you diminish that you take out of the full, you, you take out, uh, you take out, um, you make a decision, you, you do selection. And this is exactly what you can see here. This is the idea uh, which is running when you pluck strings. You have the repertory, which are the strings, and your hands are the selector. And this is the way how, and another question is, um, the question is, what are the rules? Um, what, yeah, what are the rules um, that drive my selection? 
And now I come to the question I want to see. And now it, it's really like this. And it's the same in, in uh, the electronic thing. And this is, um, so the, the first computer programs uh, Frida was, did right. They are working really like this. So you have, the, you have the parameters, you have all values of the parameters, and then you have, again, the Wahrscheinlichkeitsverteilung, which picks out of the, out of the full, uh, Frida calls it the um, multidimensionalen Parameterraum. Now I'm really running out of, of, of multidimensional parametric space. Uh, where all the values, so you have the parameter, let's say uh, a parameter is the color of a, of a square, and you also have all values, which means uh, blue, red, yellow, for example, it's all there, and then you have the Wahrscheinlichkeitsverteilung, the selection, which now picks one of these values out of the full. See, this is the thing. And um, this is exactly, I would say, uh, this is what I'm writing on at the moment. Uh, this is how the idea of electronic music, how it was developed in uh, in Cologne, works the same. You have uh, which is called subtractive klangsynthesis, subtractive sound synthesis, which means the white noise is there, and what you have to do is you have to filter out of the white noise uh, the frequencies. So the white noise, all frequencies are in the white noise. And now you have the filter, and the filter filters the frequencies you want to have out of the white noise, uh, which is a selective principle. But the question is, what are the rules uh, um, you, which govern, can you say it like this, what are the rules that govern uh, the process of selection? So the function you are writing, what rules uh, is this function um, following? And this, um, OK. So, and you, this is what I find super intriguing, that you always have in music this repertory thing. It's always fully there. You know, you have the, you have the um, complete pitches at your hand uh, on the piano, and now it's the question of selection. So we have repertory and selection, and the question is how do I, what are the reasons to select, or what, what, what is it, what makes me do uh, this selection? But you also have it on the on the on the alphabet keyboard. It's the same. You have the repertory of uh, of uh, letters, and you have the selection when you are typing. You do the selection, but what are the rules? What is the grammar? What is the syntax, semantics? All this kind of stuff, which makes me making the choice, which makes me make let do the selection. And of course, again, you have the the guitar fretboard, which is the same. Uh, so the principle is, is there. It's always there. So all, if you have a guitar in your hands, everything is already there. The complete thing. You are the selector. Uh, so let's go back to this, this thing. And in, for electronic, it's the, same. it's the same. It's the same setup. You have the sliders with which you select the full. So a synthesizer, a classic, this is a classic analog synthesizer, the Arp Odyssey, this is my hand during one of the um, actions, and um, I'm selecting out of the full. Mm. Okay, and this is now the type of guitar I bought for the actual research project. I bought six of them and six amplifiers. And with the students, we are working with. So this, I'm doing this project with the with my students, and um, we are setting up now a research uh, project with these. So six strings. How do I select? And now I can explain a lot about this, how I set it up. But this might be too much for today. I have it here, but my questions. Um, and this is a question that we are, are running. I have the repertory, I have the selection, and now my question is, are there rules at play? Or are there forces at play, constraints, that 
make me select it, but there are no rules. But out of following the constraints, I can describe it afterwards as rules. Um, yes, these are the two. This is, you know, because if you dive into the thinking about it, you, for example, you have these all these uh, different. Um, you have all these different positions. For example, you have Claude Levi Strauss, and he assumes that there are algorithms of the unconsciousness which are at work when you do intuitive selection. And this is also one of the, let's say, narrations of artificial intelligence uh, research programs that the way we are thinking that these are algorithms, you know, that, that our brain is a materialization <coughs> of algorithms which are rules for execution, you can say. Uh, but then Claude Levi Strauss says also there are algorithms at play, unconscious algorithms, but these algorithms, they work differently than the algorithms we are dealing with in our conscious world. Um, well, this is speculative, of course, but this is an interesting uh, thing to think about. And then you have uh, Gregory Bateson, who is saying um, that there are algorithms of the unconscious, but we can't um, get hold of them because they first they function totally different than uh, the algorithms we use in symbolic um, representations plus that our consciousness uh, is organized as a circle but um, the conscious this is the this, this moment we have is just a part of the circle you, un you understand? It's, so he, he describes it like this. The, um, so this is the, so this is our full conscious thing, or our way to understand the world. But as as from a self observation, self observation point of view, we never have access to the full circle, but always just to parts of it. You know, it depends on where I focus on and. And so on, and so I never get, the f I never get full. Uh, I never be able to have full access to to the circle of um, consciousness. He's calling it or something like that. But I, I have the question. Uh, the <coughs> part, sorry. Yeah, please. The part of the circle is it then one part of the circle, or is it just the line? Of the circle? No, no. Uh, which is it's like horizon. You know, it's like yeah. the sun. Yeah. So he uses this image. Yeah of the sun and the horizon, and he's calling it, so, yeah, I have the German translation, Kreis der Desbewusstseins, and he's so circle of consciousness. But we never have full self-observational access to the circle of consciousness. It's always like we have the horizon of observation, and we never can have the full picture at once. Plus, there are parts of it that we never see. Okay, so he says, yes, algorithms, yes, but no access to the algorithms that we can formalize them. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, Georg Klaus. I don't know if you know him. He's, uh, he's a classic. He's from, he was the chief cybernetic thinker in East Germany. Um, and, of course, he says, um, uh, he assumes that we are driven by algorithms, that our behavior is driven by, by algorithms. So he puts it away from the conscious consciousness thing. He, he, he takes the behavior, the behaviorism, and says, yes, behavior is algorithm driven, and we can, and we can formalize these algorithms, and then we, then we can really control it. You know? So this is his point of view. And this is the yes, and this is the this is the question I'm dealing at the moment with. My question is how can we look at this 
apprehension moment or intuitive or moment of intuitive selection? Is it rule driven? Is it and can we formalize it or is it not rule driven? If it is rule driven, do we have access to it? In which way do we have access to it? And we already discussed how complicated it is, at least in my eyes, to, to get access of it because we are we are caught up uh, in this system with internal model and then if I try to explain it to you now in English, which makes it even more complicated than the symbolic representation and so on and so on and so on. So this is the 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 point where the research where the research project is at the moment. And I have another question, but I don't know if I should ask you this now or if we should do that later, maybe I don't know. Because this is so the first question is, what is the rule by which emanation happens? Yes, are there rules? Are what there do you rules? think? And now this is really, you know, and and this is really my question uh, to you as, as research group. You know, what, what you think and what your point of views are. You know, because this is really the point where we are at the moment and I thought it would be fantastic to communicate with you, you know, and to... Is emanation for you the same as emergence? I can't tell you at the moment. I don't know. I think I understand very well what you mean. So I have talked a lot about these issues and I haven't full solution yet, but I think I have kind of an avenue mm. to which to approach it. First, I would not say that the prehension and the intuitive selection is the same. Yes. I would say that the intuitive selection may be an effect of the prehension. Once you have the prehension, then you can make a selection. Mm -hmm. and the prehension is intuitive, so by definition the whole thing is intuitive. So the prehension is not something that you can justify in terms of rational arguments, this and this and this, that is what it means and therefore I'm going that and that yes. and that. It's a holistic understanding grasping of the situation and that grasping of the situation in my theory it has these six components I don't know what I should say the six components yeah. but or maybe I can quickly say the six components yeah. the one component is the action what actions can I perform second component is value which things are good which things are bad which uh -huh. things I would like to have which are things I would like to avoid can I write? Can you? Yeah, yeah, but I'll send you. I'll send you the paper. Ah, great, great. Third component is knowledge acquisition. What can or do I need to find out more about it? These are what I would call the subjective components. The components that are basically about me, because somebody else will be able to do different actions, different uh, knowledge acquisitions, different valuation. And then you might say that the more the objective components about the thing I'm trying to prehending. The first thing is what is it? What are its properties? What are its components? That's the most simple one. Is this part of the object position or is this another point? It's what? Is this is five. We're on five four, already? Four. We're at four. 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 <laughs> another <laughs> thing is, is where does it come from? What is its cause? What is its origin? Yeah. And the third one is what is its future? What are its consequences? what's going to happen. So if I'm looking at that thing, first I need to know what this thing is, what its properties are. I need to know what can I do with that thing, I can pluck it. I can, if necessary, I need to find out more things about that thing, maybe I need to touch it or to pull it a little bit to feel how hard it is. There is a value, what, what kind of things could I do with that thing that are nice? There is the question of origin, yeah, if that thing moves a little bit, why does it move? Where does it come from? And then, if I pull on it, what's going to happen next? So these are the six components. Now, the six components, it's more like a memory aid. They are not really strictly separated in the brain. But what all the components do are they put a particular phenomenon within a network of related phenomena, mm -hmm. associated phenomena. Things that I have in my brain as associations. I have certain ideas of what you can do with this thing. I have certain ideas about sounds I like. I have certain ideas about how things might behave and what could be the effect. I have certain ideas about what might cause a thing to behave in a certain way. So I have a whole number of preconceptions 
which intuitively connect to certain things, I may not be consciously aware of that at the moment when yeah. I pull the string. Because all these things go at once, it's a holistic view. Consciousness yeah. typically is sequential, one by one you yeah. think about each of the aspects. If you do it like that, you will never play the guitar. Yeah. So you need to have all these things holistically all at once, and it can only happen at the subconscious level. Yeah. But if you sorry, mm -hmm. if you have if you combine all these like six elements, mm -hmm. you get like also like an explosion of possibilities. Right? So you have if you if you multiply them Not together. Not necessarily so no, because the one concerns the other. Right. For example, if you know what the properties of the sting are and you know what are the actions you can perform on the sting, you can see that some of these actions you would perform are not compatible with the properties of the sting. For example, you could pull very hard until the sting breaks, but knowing that the sting is strong, you know that you shouldn't die in that. Or you could try to bite on the sting, but knowing what the properties of a sting are is not going to produce a nice sound. So, the different aspects of grasping, so mm -hmm. I think grasping is a good term. Yeah. So you grasp it mentally before you grasp it physically. Mm -hmm. The grasping or the sense making or the meaning construction, these are terms I have been using, is positioning the situation at least on these six yeah, But it seems like this, this, this moment of these little moments of conscious apprehension, which is you describe as being kind of sequential seems to be like really important. Uh, they're not sequential in general. Oh, I thought that's what you just no. said. No, no, they, they are six components, but typically you have a holistic view of them mm -hmm. because it happens subconsciously. Subconsciously, your brain is at the same time thinking about value and about no, no, but I'm talking about causes and about effects. Ah, yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about this moment of, conscious, moment of consciousness, which is related to this moment of uh, apprehension. Like I think also you need in a sense like to one of well, one of the ways of dealing with this is to in a sense hold one of the one variable still for a while. So to say like okay, so what if I think about the string? You know, like what if I think about the length of the string? If I hold that as like a variable in my mind, then something in my subconscious network will then start relating these other elements to this one thing that I hold still. You can do it like that, but that's not say the scientific approach. Mm. It's slow, it's a bit rigid, it may get you deeper into it, but that's not how most of the time you work. If you would do that each time you encounter something, you would not get very far. So most of the things, that, that's the subconscious part, and that's the intuition part. The intuition part recognizes things about this thing, activates related notions like songs that you have heard mm -hmm. produced by stings and feelings of tension that you have felt in stings and uh, vibrations that you have seen in stings. There will be a whole bunch of expectations in your mind. These things will be activated in your mind or bright in your mind. That means you're prepared to see them. And then I would say the moment of selection, then it's a conscious one. Intuitive selection is, in a sense, a good term because the intuition is what precedes the selection. The selection itself is conscious, but the intuition is all the subconscious associations along these six dimensions that prepares the terrain and that kind of poises you in a certain direction. That's where the constraints come from. The constraints are not hard, it's not rules, but implicitly your nervous system is is biased in a certain direction. There are certain things it's likely to do and other things that it's unlikely to do. What it will actually do, there's still a bit of indeterminism there, that's a spur of the moment thing, it can be yes. just a random thing. So it's not deterministic, but it is very much constrained in the sense that this whole intuition, this grasping, this sense making, has kind of prepared the terrain, and that's what is called in, in, in psychology, it has primed a number of options. Mm. I'm not sure Priming that means that you kind of <laughs> pre-activate things, so yeah, yeah. the choice is limited. I kind of agree with everything you're saying, it's just that in that, I feel intuitively uh, introspection, it's like if I'm, 
if I'm in that moment of suspension, right, where I'm waiting for the thought, the impulse to come, I'm waiting to kind of somehow make sense of the situation, um, I'm not just waiting passively. It's not like I'm just waiting passively for my subconscious to throw something up. It is that. And I am, and I am sitting patiently kind of watching the images and the impulses that fire up and I'm kind of waiting to see if one gets stronger or waiting to see if one kind of clicks somehow. But there's also, there's also something else I'm, I'm, I'm busy with other, that's not just waiting for my, my um, subconscious. And observing my, it's partly about observing my subconscious, but it's also there's something conscious which I'm doing with my attention. Yeah. Like yes. I'm, I'm consciously directing my attention yeah, to bits of my subconscious as they come up, or things which I'm seeing around me. Like I'm con consciously directing my attention to say a, a string or a part of the guitar, even if it's just for a second, and I instantly get the feedback that that triggers another kind of reaction from my from my subconscious, and then I see what happens mm -hmm. there, and then after a few seconds, I'll consciously change my attention somewhere else. So, 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 so there's, there is, I think, this, there's, there's something very important that you're doing with your consciousness, which has to do with suspension of decision making, but it's still active. But this is a good point. That's or, uh, you know, the this is what I wanted to explain here with this basic thing in the holistic, what 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 you are saying, uh, uh, directing my attention means that I never have the full access to the six components uh, interactivism. And this, what does it mean? Can we, can we put it into sequence? So can I, say, uh, can I say, now I put my attention on this? This is what, I, I guess, this is what you meant. And this, of course, I never play a tone uh, at the guitar if I do it, doing it like this in, in an artistic approach. And I wonder if uh, and I wonder if it is possible to do it the scientific way then to re uh, to, uh, and then to construct it afterwards, you know, to, s to set it together and see what happens if I do it like this. Do you understand what I mean? Well, I'm not sure, but what I want to say about consciousness is that consciousness by definition is kind of like a focus, like all kinds of things that are going on in your subconscious mind, yeah. in parallel, simultaneously, and it's like a searchlight that yes. is point on a particular thing, and that searchlight moves on. Yes, I agree. So you can yeah. only be conscious exactly. really of one thing at a time, exactly. but you can control to some degree where the Focus yes. Goes. Yes. So what? What I think what what Orion is trying to to uh, describe is the global workspace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the global workspace. When you have in this situation this kind of global awareness, but it's not yet clear what you do. You may single out something and say yes. I first want to uh, first want to um, first want to um, the the tension of this thing, and then maybe put my finger in this way, and then maybe pull the sting. So in that sense, there is still a process with a number of subsets that can be conscious. Yeah, but the process uh, will not consider all the aspects. Yes. It will so you know, like you know, sorry, you know, like we talk about like inactive cognition. Mm -hmm. So you, you you test something in the outside world yeah. and you see the feedback that you get from that. It's it's almost like the inverse of that. So your your conscious is kind of engaged in a process of inaction with your subconscious mm -hmm. by directing attention to something. Consciously, you, you, in a sense, you give, an, you, you give, you change the parameters of your subconscious, and then you see what you get back. Yes, I, I think that's a good, a good description. Yeah. That's, uh, that's nice. There is yeah. also this concept of Colin Oliveros, the deep listening, where the listening is understood as more of this uh, idea of listening as going towards the subject, so that you're not in a passive state of a. Um, hearing, but in the active state of listening, where the, the that which is what you're listening to, your attention goes to the source of of that sound, that's called mm. sound, that's yeah, something yeah. else. So you go towards the source, yeah. which is unavailable, which is the creative act. 
So the listening itself is already the creative act. And it's not what comes out of this listening that is the creative act. I didn't get the last one. Mm. So we're talking how these methods and, and intuitive understanding of what is going on will put you in the state of creating, that outputting, or what you called it, emanating. But in fact, that's kind of like the byproduct. Actually, the creative act is that you're already in this state. The mm -hmm. creative act yeah. is mm -hmm. that you're listening. Yes, yeah. I, I think this I brings on, yeah. I think your, your, your <coughs> notion brings in another aspect, or another level. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't see it as another aspect, actually. That, that's why I wanted to add to it. Because uh, we, we already talked about the, the, the global workspace, which, which yes. is the hypothesis of the brain. Uh, but, and, and it kind of, uh, um, what, what the, in, in investigating creativity for, from artificial intelligence, I also came to this concept of the workspace is, as, is essential. And what you're doing in that attention state of mind yeah. is actually uh, filtering the workspace. And yeah. Um, yeah. so in relation to grasping, I would like to give the, the, the prime example I did with, with, with the experiment is that um, you, 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 if, you, if you have your attention at a certain thing, you can actually observe something that, that then allows you to actually play with it in your workspace. Uh, it, can, it can, can I ask you, what is, uh, so, so one thing is going through my mind, of course this is, an, I would say, an, again, an emanative concept. Uh, because, um, like Francis put it, the, it's all is there in the searchlight. The searchlight, the, my consciousness as searchlight, which is searching it. This is the selection already. This is already a process of try to imagine that selection. You give like can I describe it like it's this? It is, but it's a different a moment of selection to the one you're talking about. Yes, I know, I know. But but I just, what I want to say is, as a as a basic principle. It's, it's, could it be described like that? Can I? Or put it the other way, you can describe it as a searchlight or you can describe it as a filter, you well, know? Try to, try to do the both. Like, if, if you look, at, you look at, a, at, a, at a scene, right? And there's a spotlight on it. Yeah. And there's a blue color, blue spotlight. Yeah. And then someone changes from blue to yellow and suddenly the whole color changes and you start understanding that some things that were black weren't black. So I didn't get it. I didn't get the I mean, you you're filtered. So your spotlight has a filter, as a color filter. Yes. Right. And things may appear black, but when the spotlight changes from red to yellow, ah, okay, the, the black it. wasn't black. Oh, but this and is suddenly another. you realize things and can start playing with it. Okay, I understand. But this is another filter so, but that's function, like which is which is which is applied to the basic function that the spotlight itself is already a selection. Yeah, that's you know what I mean? That's yes. yes. There's Indeed. a very poetic uh, thought by William Blake on this mm -hmm. that said that if we didn't have the senses to, to limit our understanding of the world, the world would come with us infinite as it is. Well, so we you couldn't think, we, we have to have yeah. the senses in order to limit we are filters. the infinite. We are filters. Yeah, you can well, take the virus. <laughs> no, in, in a sense, the whole uh, brain and the cognitive process is, is a sequence of selections. You come yeah. in with yes. such an infinite amount of information, and step yeah. by step you make selections until the last selection is, I plug this thing at this moment yes. or not. Yes. Okay. Can I just add perhaps one distinction? I'm, I'm a musician myself, and I was thinking about Miles Davis, yeah. Keith Richards. They the kind of artists which are really uh, have a lot of muscle memory. It's a kind of an embodied cognition. Mm. They do yeah. movements. They they know yes. how it feels to do that. Yes. And they, the not the sound this will make. They know this. They they do this on the same level. They, they have this because he fell. He, he falls asleep with his guitar. Yes. Keith Richards. Yes. I think. But, but <laughs> that kind of memory, I would relate it to motor uh, action, motor schemata, th those mm -hmm. kind of memories. Th I think they can strongly influence the way you hear the music. So the way you are playing your instrument and will influence the way you hear music, and then you can make a selection about what you are going to do and, and just 
grasp into that music. So there's a feedback loop yeah. in a number of directions. But I think em embodied cognition is a really important aspect, which I didn't see completely yet in, 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 in the, the, the components Francis said. But okay. it's, more it, it's very clear, because the whole thing yeah. is about the feedback between actions and perceptions. So I, I didn't yeah. specify that, but the whole scheme is, a, is a it's single, situated yeah. and embodied and active. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Ah, okay. Talking about bodies, we should leave uh, this room <laughs> 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 in eight point. minutes. So, um, so you know, if you have more slides to wrap up, or maybe the sound, or no, no sound. We will make sound. Yeah, what was the second question? We can continue the conversation. Um, uh, yes, I would. The second the question, then maybe. Uh, but the cafe yeah. it's, uh, it's the cafe or it's it, yeah. it clear? Is it okay? Yeah. No. Because this is another. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation. Really, really, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.